everybody and their mama is running for president of the United States. Stephen A. Smith, The Rock, Aaron Rodgers, Steph Curry. Who doesn't want to be president of the United States? We're going to talk about it with Steve Kim. Dak Prescott's in hot water. A woman is trying to Deshaun Watson, Dak. Uh, Gilbert Arenas thinks that Michael Jordan used steroids. And uh, Nick Saban went before Congress and said what we all think about college football. It's been ruined. Uh, great episode of Fearless. Buckle up. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I'm Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Wednesday. Thank you for joining me. Uh, this episode is brought to you by our good friends at Good Ranchers. Fall in love with beef, chicken, seafood all over again by subscribing to GoodRanchers.com. Use my promo code FEARLESS to get a free $119 Heritage Ham plus $25 off any box with your subscription. Good Ranchers, thank you so much for rejoining us. And we need to repay Good Ranchers by supporting them. Uh, wow, what a show we have uh, today. I need you guys to start pounding that like and subscription button if you're watching over YouTube. If you're listening over Apple or wherever you get your podcast, hit that five-star rating. It's important. The algorithms, the headwinds, they're against us. We need to push back. I need you to join me. The number one thing you can do, though, the number one thing you can do, subscribe to blazetv.com, please. BlazeTV.com slash fearless. Use my promo code fearless and you can save $20 on your yearly subscription. If you want the Fearless Army to continue to have success and grow and be sustainable and succeed, sign up BlazeTV.com slash fearless. Use our promo code fearless uh, right now. Uh, today's show. I want to start with <laughs> what is going on? Are, are, are we a serious country or, or, or should we find humor in the fact that everybody wants to be president? RFK Jr. is allegedly considering Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback, the, the, the guy that stood up on the vaccine deal, one of my favorite NFL players, independent thinker. I, I mean, I love Aaron Rodgers, but vice president of the United States? I'm not so sure. Steph Curry, let's play SOT number one. Steph Curry, NBA star for the Golden State Warriors. Steph Curry has presidential aspirations. Let's play the clip. I, I have an interest in leveraging every part of my influence for, for good in the way that I can. So if that's the way to do it, then I'm not saying the presidency, but if, well, if, that, if the May, politics, that's May, May babe, but May I'm May. saying. If politics is a way that you can create meaningful change, or if there's another way outside of politics, you know, that we can do. You're not ruling it out? No. 2028, you never <laughs> not know. Not that soon. Not that soon, okay. Unbelievable. Uh, let's play SOT number three, just to remind you, The Rock, University of Miami football player, pro wrestler, now The Rock, a movie star, he may. They, people want him to run for president, and he's thought about it. Play the clip. Just so we got a basketball player, a football player, an actor in The Rock, and now a pathological liar in Stephen A. Smith. Let's just refresh your memory that Stephen A. Smith, and if you look at the way his book is written, you look at all the things he's been saying recently, Stephen A. Smith wants in on politics in some capacity. Let's refresh your memory, Stephen A. Smith. He asked me that question, and I said, if the American people wanted me to run for the presidency of the United States of America, I was strongly considerate, and damn it, I mean it. I mean, it, listen, listen, it, 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 it ain't that big of a standard. I mean, let's call it what it is. I think I got a shot. I mean, I, just, I, don't know, I don't know if people will vote for me, but if they convinced me that they wanted me to do it, I was strongly considerate. 
Steve Kim, I, I got to bring you into this discussion. I mean, look, we could mention Mark Cuban, and, and we can blame uh, Donald Trump, you know, the apprentice, the billionaire. He Maybe he set the stand. I think of the Zelensky guy over in Ukraine. I think he's some sort of comedian that turned into the leader of Ukraine. But is this just ego run amok? Is this just millionaire egos run amok? To a certain degree, but the, these are puppets for hire. Uh, and to paraphrase you and the great Logan Roy, we are not serious people. And it kind of reminds me of a, of a clip that came up on my YouTube feed about a week ago from Malcolm X, who said there's no culture that trots out their singers and dancers and athletes and celebrities as the community voice. He thought it was disgusting. He thought it was counterproductive, incredibly ineffective. And it made a bit of a farce and a mockery of those said people who want them to be their leaders. And I just look at, look, Stephen A. Smith, based on his history of fudging the truth and double talking, he might be the most qualified to actually run for public <laughs> office. So maybe he's ready. OK, so he's OK. Here's the other thing. With, with like Stephen Curry, I remember about a year or two ago, him and his wife had objections on their palatial estate. They didn't want some low income housing unit or some sort of thing that was going to be built near them. They said, oh, no, 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 no. So based on that double talk, maybe he's qualified to be a politician. I get it. But uh, look, I get it. Donald Trump was a celebrity who was on television, who was a pop culture icon who became president. But the difference in my view, and I know many people are going to disagree with this, though, he had practical business experience for decades. Now, you can question that record all you want in his tactics or his ethics, but I believe that he was a much more accomplished person than somebody that can consistently hit three-point jump shots. Look, with Steph Curry, with the game on the line, he might be one of my first choices with that basketball. But in terms of policy-making and decision, I don't want any basketball player. Maybe Bill Bradley. But again, Bill Bradley's education level was a little bit different. We need to get serious and understand who was leading our country. And these people that you just mentioned, they're all puppets. They have no original thought on their own. I don't think they have any leadership abilities, except this is an indictment on the jock-sniffing celebrity culture that we currently have in our country. Yeah, it is a reflection of us that this could even be bantered about and thought about. It, it says, uh, like, how stupid we are and that yes. they think we are. But, but, but let, let's, I mean, <laughs> this will be a struggle. But of those four, Aaron Rodgers, mm. Steph Curry, The Rock, Stephen A. Smith, if someone put a gun to Steve Kim's head and said, you got to vote for one of these guys to be president, who would it be? Oh, my God. See, you're asking me, Steve, would you rather have <laughs> Hodgkin's, leukemia, uh, AIDS, or uh, malaria? I mean, none of them are good. So it's like, what, what's the least of our problems? Now, I'm going to surprise you here, Jason. Now, you think because of the association with I, I, the U. I love this Mount Rushmore. <laughs> yeah. So oh, you, you would go with the U? With the U that I'm going to pick Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. No. I'm not because he's with that whole group that includes Oprah. He's part of that uh, cabal. I don't want to say the big I word that uh, ends with Adi. I'm just saying I don't like the group he associates with. I'm not so sure about any of his policies. Out of those four, who do I like? I think Aaron Rodgers probably more closely aligns with the things that I believe in, just common sense and some of his other stances. But again, I don't take him seriously. I really don't as much as I like and admire him as a football player. But Jason, can I come clean? Because I am like George Washington. I cannot tell a lie. Just recently, I did vote for Steve Garvey. I did. He's running for Congress. Ah, I, 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 yeah. I couldn't help it. I'm named after him. That's the God's honest truth. I am after, named. My, my mom was a big Dodger fan when we grew up. We used to watch all the games. But what really sealed it for me was game four of the 84 NLCS. When he took Lee Smith deep to tie that series, I said, you know what? That's a man one day I'm going to vote for. So, here, so I didn't vote for a lot of other things. I had no idea who they are. So I got out my pen and I said, okay, Garv, 
Garvey, you got my vote and I mailed that thing in. So I admit it. I fell for it. I, I am a bit of a hypocrite. I, I have to admit has, that. But in post-career, has Steve Garvey like done things in the political world that have prepared him at all to, to move into this vein? Well, yeah, well, he had a sex scandal. Remember, he was having kids out of wedlock that weren't his. And I, I remember in San Diego, it really shattered my image of my idol. There used to be bumper stickers in San Diego. It said, Steve Garvey's not my padre. And I was like, wow, you went there. But, you know, <laughs> the thing is, here's, yeah, seriously, I got to get one of those. So oh, here's, wow. here's, here's the thing with Garvey, though. He's a Republican and he is conservative. As of right now, that's good enough for me. And he won five gold gloves. Okay? So with those qualifications, he got the old Kimster's vote. That's what we do here. We I research this stuff and here so, with Locke. And so of the four candidates that I've mentioned today, it, it's funny. I, I can't choose, but you did spur a thought in my mind. The only one of those four that has taken a position that I agree with or and really hey even know anything about is hey Rod. Aaron Rodgers. Right. It, and the way he stood up against the vaccine. And so that would make him the front runner for me. I don't know what The Rock uh, stands for or what, what and I've heard rumors. I don't want to out the guy, but I've heard rumors from some former teammates of his at the U, and I'm not... Warren Sapp, I don't think, was a teammate. I don't think they're the same age. So I'm not talking about Warren Sapp. But I've heard from people uh, that played football at the U with The Rock that The Rock is actually a fan of me and this show. I've heard. That's a rumor. I, I'm probably getting The Rock in trouble Whoa. for repeating that. That's bad gossip. It, it could get him in, in trouble. But I get, all these guys, they know common sense when they see it. They just know that, hey, that's not part of the script. That's not what gets them paid. And so they have to do something else. But I have heard rumors uh, Jason, about that. I've heard from guys. Yeah. For the record, The Rock and Warren Sapp were teammates for much of their careers. Uh, they kind of came in, I oh. think, a year apart. And Dwayne Johnson was the backup on a loaded defensive line that had four NFL draft choices. It was Warren, Kenneth Holmes, Kennard Lang, and Pat Riley, not the coach. And he was the fifth guy. So he played, and they were teammates, for the record. Oh, so I want to be crystal clear. Warren Sapp has not told me that. It was not that. Warren Sapp. Now yes, I'm in it was trouble. not the quarterback It was killer. not Warren yes. Sapp. <laughs> it's not no, Warren it was Sapp. not the QB killer. I, I, I screwed. The, so I just want to be clear Warren yeah. Sapp of that. And, yeah. and I, I'm, I'm sorry for smearing The Rock's name that, and letting people know that there are rumors. <laughs> the Rock has actual Christian values and a yeah. pair of balls. There are rumors. That, that's just a rumor. Don't hold him to it. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> as it relates to, I don't know what Steph, what does Steph Curry stand for? I mean, I, all I remember at one point, he was enamored with uh, Sean Martin Luther Cream uh, King, you know, Talcum X. Uh, and and by the way, I don't, we, we, we <laughs> I should have talked about this. You know, Martin Luther Cream has converted to Talcum yes. X officially. You know, he's now a Muslim. I, I don't know if yeah, he's... Yeah, Salam Aleikum. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's had his last yeah. ham sandwich, but he's got bean pies now. So, yeah, we're good. The man's a chameleon. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, literally, he went from Martin Luther Cream to Talcum X in reality. I mean, that's quite a transition. But it, it, I just remember Steph Curry at one point admitting publicly that he talks regularly to Sean King and so that's kind of disqualifying uh, for me. Uh, but, you know, maybe Sean, uh, maybe Steph Curry's recovered from that. Stephen A. Smith, though, is a script reader and a pathological liar, just like yes. you said. Mm. And so someone Qualified. could put a battery in his back and have yes. him read a prompter, and, and he, could, he could potentially knock it out of the park. Uh, and, and Stephen A is a bit of a wild card. Stephen A wants in politics so bad, and he understands the political game so well, or someone has told him, he's willing to play for either team, Democrat or Republican. Whoever will sign him up and cut some checks and give him some insider trading info, he'll do it. I mean, he, he, yeah. he, he will do it. But he could be like a Nikki Haley for the Republican Party. Oh, Rhino. God, yeah, the, the worst rhino of all time. Here's the thing. 
what I didn't like, did not like about Stephen A. Smith. Didn't he tell Sir Charles recently in their sit down, I am a fiscal conservative, but a so no, no, I am a fiscal conservative, but a social, um, whatever that other liberal. side, liberal. And I'm thinking yeah. to myself, okay, all right. Uh, I like my switch hitters to be Mickey Mantle or Eddie Murray. You got to pick a side here. We're in a cultural war. But could you imagine um, Stephen A. Smith doing a speech? And I, I quote the great, uh, not great, George Herbert Bush. Could you imagine Stephen A. Smith blurting out, read my lips? No, no. Taxes. I, 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 I got to work on my Stephen A. Smith, admittedly. But I, look, if you want to go with the guy that will literally go with the approved messaging and will eventually become just a drone and a robot, for political purposes that will not serve the masses, yes, I think Stephen A. Smith, out of those four, um, he might be the most willing accomplice. Uh, he would be. Uh, Steve, let's switch up topics. Have you heard about uh, Gilbert Arenas, this whole mm, mm, Michael mm. Jordan, LeBron James feud oh, that Scap man. Attack's involved in, and yes, you got all job. these guys on social media uh, building cloud off of arguing Jordan versus LeBron James. This thing's getting out of hand. And, uh, you know, I think our interview that you hooked us up with with Victor Conte played a role in this. Yes. Uh, and, and so now Gilbert Arenas is basically saying, hold up. You know, y'all want to play the uh, steroid card on LeBron. He played it on Michael Jordan in a conversation with Rashad McCants. Let's play the clip. Same reason Michael Jordan wasn't tired when he was on the floor. Who want to go there? <laughs> Let's not go there. Tell me why. Uh, you can, so tell me why. You can run it. <laughs> tell you me can why. run that same why narrative of everybody running. Why? But I can not? tell you, go you're, look at eight. You're 40. You're 40. You're never tired. My knees hurt watching you. Okay. Right. <laughs> you doing this? Hey, do y'all know Jordan? Yeah. Jordan. <laughs> hey, Jordan. Y'all didn't hear that? We played. You ain't tired? We played three rounds of 18 holes of golf in the day, mm -hmm. and then Jordan come out and give us 55. I'm tired as hell, but Jordan wasn't. You ain't sweating? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Why Jordan wasn't sweating on the floor. Jordan wasn't sweating either. 40, you probably sweating at least. Uh -huh. Three rounds of 18 golf. Why are you not golf. tired? But I'm saying, whatever you're saying, just remember, just remember, there's six tests now. There was Why one you about test. Tests? I'm just saying. There's six I'm tests now. No tests. There's, I know what you're trying to get. There's six tests now. There was one test back then. Mm. So all the players that was playing 82 games every year, mm. whoo, walking through the NBA season, all those players. You gonna be rubbing your knees when you watch it? I'm just, I just, if we just want to go there, if you just want to go there, you know what I mean? There was a lot of players playing 82 games per. My, what did Michael Jordan play at 40 years old, averaging 20? I no those, sleep. I know the knees are. Golfing, I know the smoking, knees are. drinking, cigar, smoke, cigar smoking, smoking straight, drinking, smoking gambling. Yak. And it looked like, and he played sweating, all 82 straight, games. Straight. Michael Jordan sweating warm up line. 82 games. Hey, hey, he did, he did play. 82 games. He did play in 82 as games. As a 40 year old man, <laughs> averaging 20, who gambled, then you smoked, say you know cigar, why? smoked. Then you say you know why, though? Then you say you know why? I know why. I'm just asking right. you. If you want to throw out those scenarios, we can just, let's just go through history and just rip it all you apart. You said you know why, though. Let's rip it all apart. So if you know why and I know why, we know I'm, why. I'm just wondering, every other sport got busted for, mm. uh -uh. besides the NBA. Just you know why, weird, right? I know why, we know I'm why. I'm just saying, if everyone knows the NBA had a drug problem in the 80s, but nobody got caught for drugs in their system, don't that sound a little weird? Uh -huh. You have it on record, players, were gambling on games. They had drug problems, and they were shaving points in games. It is on record. FBI had to come in, but not one drug test proved it. I, was, I mean, come on now. I, I, Let's just leave it as it is and just watch the game like everybody else. Because if you want to dig, we can dig, no, I just, and I can show you some pictures. No. I can show you some pictures of full head of hair. No, no, three months no. later, <laughs> hairline gone. No, no. <laughs> Buffered in a month. Out there. No. All I'm saying is, end of the season. No. End of the season like this. No. Whole front <laughs> gone. No. Three months later. <laughs> Buffed in the mud. We no. can. So let's not. This thing.
is ugly, man. And, and, and I say that a bit with a smile on my face, but also like this whole Jordan LeBron debate that's been going on now for 15 years, it's getting really, really ugly. And, and, and people are, I mean, because I don't, have you seen these pictures of, and I think they're distorted, but it like shows Jordan as a rookie with hair. And then they show him later in his career, he's kind of muscled up and he's bald. I can't tell if any of it's photoshopped or been massaged, but this feud is getting ugly. What's your take on Gilbert well, Arenas? Uh, yeah. I still don't think this is as bad an accusation as Jordan couldn't go to his left. I actually find that more offensive than this stuff. Because again, <laughs> everyone is suspicious. Um, here's the thing though, with Gilbert Arenas, he's completely ignorant here. He doesn't even have the facts right. When they're saying that no one failed the drug test, really? Tell that to Roy Tarpley. He was literally thrown out of the league. Roy Tarpley was this great big man, had a lot of skills. Um, he failed drug tests so many times he got kicked out of the league. Uh, the Houston Rockets had a, play, a pair of guys that were really Mitchell effective Wiggins, players maybe? around. The, Mitchell Wiggins and Mitchell Lewis Wiggins, Floyd. Uh, yeah, and Lewis yeah. Floyd, Black Magic. They got kicked out of the league. Yep. This whole notion that somehow guys were not caught. You want to bet there was a lot of drug busts. Now, the question is, was it PEDs? The other thing about Jordan, in terms of his hairline, also now we're getting into hairlines, kind of like LeBron James, right? So if that's your evidence, and here's the thing. If you ever look at pictures of his father, James Jordan, God rest his soul, that looks very hereditary. The way their hairlines actually faded, actually, like, you could just tell that was something that was passed on. Now, is the accusation that James Jordan growing up fixing appliances uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina, was he on like uh, PEDs too? The other thing that's really interesting is, and this is where guys like this do not understand context. The reason why there are strong allegations about LeBron is that he had close associates that were linked in a biogenesis scandal. Now, Unless you could show me proof that Juanita Jordan or one of his best friends, like one of those bodyguards, uh, was linked into a steroid mill or an HGH factory and that they were having packages delivered. All right, like, uh, please send to AKA Jumpman with the address, <laughs> then yes. So I have not seen that happen, and I don't want to besmirch the first wife or the Original wife of Michael Jordan, you're a fine lady. I'm sure you would never go to such uh, lengths. All I'm saying is that, again, with Michael Jordan, yes, he got heavier. There's no doubt about it. He did work out. But, again, it is the context in which we are making these accusations or have these suspic suspicions, which is the big difference here. You make excellent points, and I'm glad you did. Uh, you may, you, you've given me something to think about. Having said that, I, I do think this is collateral damage, unintended consequences of this war going on between yeah. Jordan supporters and LeBron supporters. And obviously I'm on Team Jordan. You're likely on team, team Jordan. You think? And, and you think, part huh? of... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and part of what part of what is bothering me is the same thing that I think bothered my father and his generation. Yeah, I grew up in Indianapolis. My father grew up, knew Oscar Robertson, the whole Robertson family. Oscar had a brother that was really good, too. And there was a guy named Willie Gardner who may have been more talented than any of them that could have been. But, but I can remember my father and his generation when we started anointing Magic and Larry as the greatest <laughs> yeah. ever, they were like, well, hold on. You just gonna forget about Bill Russell and blah, blah, blah. And we didn't appreciate, and we all dis. Well, they only had nine teams in that era. And you know, all those white guys played and, and we, dis we diminished the era before us. And again, my father and them were like, Man, Oscar Robinson averaged a triple double, and he was, a, you know, he was tremendous. And and y'all just anointing Magic and Larry, and Michael, and so maybe we did the same thing that's being done now, but it it just feels different. Jason, that th this disrespect the for the '90s and what I saw with my own yeah. eyes feels different. Look, there comes a point where everyone in our lives 
we become the old barbers in coming to America. Okay? Like, he ain't no Joe Lewis. He ain't no, I mean, that, that's just the way it is. And I've, I've reached that point and I embrace it because I know what I saw was better. A couple of things here. By the way, speaking of another guy that got kicked out of the league due to drugs, Quentin Daly. Happened to be one of Michael Jordan's teammates for, I think, about Same a week. Quentin Daly. Yes, yeah, him. Actually had a three-day run with the Lakers, and then he went to training camp, disappeared, and Jerry West had to cut him. So this whole notion that nobody got caught for drugs, it's not true. John Lucas got caught so many times, he started his own rehab center where he's helped a lot of people. Now, in terms of Jordan's game, the evolution athletically, from his rookie year to about the first or second championship, he was a high-flying guy that played over the rim. By the time he won his third or fourth championship, so let's go into the second three-peat after his hiatus into baseball. If you watch his game, he's no longer this high flyer. Even though he could be, he would turn it on, but it was a much more economical game And in the last three championships, the basis of his offense, for the most part, was turnaround jumpers and the fadeaway and pull-ups. He did, even when he dunked, he would make sure he just dunked it, but he wasn't putting on any posterizations where you'd be like, that's the greatest dunk I ever saw. And then when you take a look at when he was a much heavier, older guy with the Washington Wizards, it became like a national event. It was like a spotting of a dodo bird when he would actually dunk once a month on those old creaky knees of his. And I think that's another thing, again, where you lose context. His game actually did evolve where it was less athleticism throughout his run. There was almost like this natural uh, go- natural regression of athletic skills. And he had to go out there and find ways to put the ball into the hole that had nothing to do with attacking the rim. So that's another part of that argument. Again, you could look at the stats all you want, but watch those games with the Washington Wizards. Everything was basically a mid-range type of jumper at that point. Steve, I'm going to tell you the other thing that just bothers me as a journalist and as a bit of a contrarian and just a realist. During Jordan's era, you could publicly criticize Michael Jordan. Yes, I did it. I, I did it. I, I was a Shame prominent Shame national you. sports columnist uh, in Kansas City, on ESPN, on Fox Sports, and I would criticize Jordan publicly. And I used to, I mean, and part of it was a bias. I had an extreme bias because I was a Pacer fan, just growing up as a kid. And so, you know, we were competing against him with Reggie Miller and all of that. And so I would call him hot air. I, I mean, consistently in columns, what? I called him what? hot air. You, and oh, and <laughs> the other thing, again, by by late in his career, I was sympathetic, not late, but early in his championship runs, I was sympathetic to Isaiah Thomas and the Detroit Pistons. And we were allowed, the Pistons were allowed to beat him up, and people in the media were allowed to beat up Jordan. And it wasn't until Michael Jordan retired that I was like, okay, I'm over it. He's better than Magic. You know, I'm going to give it up to him. And then I started celebrating Jordan once he retired. But as long as he was playing, the Pacer homer in me and just I wanted him to earn it. But now there's this groupie mentality in the media where anybody that's pretty elite or at the top, it's like you can't criticize them. There's all this social media blowback. And also... Because of the amount of money that LeBron James has been able to acquire, thanks to the work of Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, LeBron is a media mogul who pays surrogates to argue for him. Michael Jordan, maybe Michael Wilbon and a couple other people had access to Jordan or whatever, but... It wasn't this payroll thing. It wasn't all these extracurricular benefits that you got from being a Michael Jordan worshiper. And the critics were allowed to live and breathe and do their thing in the media. I want to play you this clip of Shannon Sharp and Kendrick Perkins basically having an on-air fight. And maybe you saw this. They're having an on-air fight about who's been a groupie longer and better Ugh. for LeBron James. Jeez. This is unprecedented. Play the clip. <sighs> you are hey, with the clip. Hey, tell, stay with hey, 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 tell me. 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 T
talking about you just hopped on this LeBron train. I've been on this train since 2001. You forgot. Now, let me go take you in history. Me and LeBron played together. Me and LeBron was in the Mickey D's class. So when it comes to being an advocate for LeBron James, you just joined the family reunion. You just got you a side of the I can't tell. You do well, guess what? Well, guess what, Per? Well, guess what, Per? Nothing about advocating for LeBron. I, I I can't. Here's I, I've never understood it with Shannon Sharp because he's such an elite, accomplished athlete, three-time Super Bowl winner, sure, a Hall of Fame tight end, was a serious, serious athlete in the NFL, unquestioned accomplishments. I've never understood why he became a groupie for LeBron James, other than it worked as a television stick opposite Skip Bayless. But I just it just never struck me as like I've never seen an athlete do this to himself. Kendrick Perkins, marginal or journeyman NBA player, played on the same McDonald's All-American team with LeBron James. I, I understand it a bit more. Kendrick Perkins, not, well, neither one of these guys have the best uh, verbal presentation, but I just can't believe accomplished, masculine athletes are debating you know, who's, who has served LeBron better and longer on national TV? It blows my mind. You know, all I heard was, I've been on LeBron's jock longer than you. No, 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 no. I've been on his jock better than you. Yeah, not, not exactly cool Modi against LL Cool J, huh? Yeah. A couple of things here. Let, let's rewind. First of all, a sh I'm going to get some of your archives. I'm going to clip them out. I'm going to send them to Scap Attack. Your your slander of the great Michael Jeffrey Jordan, I think this needs to be a video. Scap, if you're out there, I think this one might be worth about 15 minutes. Let's investigate what Jason Whitlock was saying about our version of Babe Ruth. This is shameful. But you're right about the um, criticism. I'll never forget, and I, and I saw this a couple of weeks ago. I was doing some um, research. Do you remember when Michael Jordan after the – this was during their three-peat run – when a really rough, tough New York Knicks team went up on them, one nothing would eventually go up 2 nothing. But in between one of those games in New York, Michael and his father actually went to Atlantic City to blow off steam, and I think they got back at early in the morning. Never mind, they had a night game. The media killed Jordan. Absolutely killed Michael, and Michael was pissed off, wouldn't talk to anybody except Ahmad Rashad. And they ran this big interview on NBC, and Michael had glasses on. Maybe his eyes were all bloodshot. And even Ahmad goes, uh, why are you wearing glasses? And Michael goes, because I want to. That's why. And so, and then, th then Michael was even criticized. Get this. Air Jordans were kind of popular shoes. So I've, heard, I've heard a lot of kids buy them. And there was a thing, maybe it still goes on, where people were being robbed and killed for them. And there was a segment of the media that blamed Michael Jordan for not doing more, as if somehow he's going to provide a GPS or a security system, never mind the culture of people um, that have the mindset to kill someone else or rob someone of their property and their shoes. And somehow Jordan became this figure of, you must, you must save our society and our culture in Chicago. That's the type of heat that he got. And compare that to the kid glove treatment that you get now with LeBron James. And no matter what he says, no one has enough blowback to say, who really did paint your walls outside your home? Why did you paint old? You're not even allowed to question that, or you're probably not going to get credentialed anymore. That's just the way it is. Last thing. Um, the one thing that I found out is like, even with Isaiah now complaining that Jordan needs to give me a public apology, Isaiah, you are an all-time great player. I have so much respect for you. You're, you're, you're on my all-time NBA top 12. You'd be on my roster. You're not getting an apology, and he doesn't have to give one. Bottom line, you need to get over it. And I'm actually on your side in a lot of this. And so it's amazing to me that Jordan is now being slandered. But I tell you what's great about it, Jason, the fact he never says a thing. He moves in silence. That only adds to his mystique in my view. Yeah, and so LeBron people are sitting there going, what do you mean LeBron never gets criticized? What about the decision? And that the decision and that first NBA final series with the Miami Heat, that's the last time LeBron has faced stiff 
consistent criticism from the media. Uh, mm. And, and I, I apologize for the narcissism of this, but all I can remember of people that criticized LeBron in a straightforward manner that, that mattered at any time was me and occasionally mm. Bill Simmons. Occasionally mm. yes. Bill Simmons. And, and other than that, everybody petrified of LeBron. And, and ba Bill Simmons would probably argue that his criticism of LeBron is one of the reasons he got removed from that ESPN NBA countdown show is because you just couldn't yeah. do it. And, and, um, and, I'm, and, and I think of, I mean, when I think of this era, I think of Peter Vesey used to be the gold standard for yes. NBA coverage. <laughs> yes. He, he, he would break news, and he would be very critical of the players, coaches, and whatever. And now, Adrian Wojnarowski is the gold standard for NBA. He, he, he never offers a strong or interesting opinion, and he breaks the news that's handed to him by the sources that are in bed with him. And, and, and he's even less relevant now and, and the people that actually control the NBA discussion are Stephen A. Smith, a pathological liar, uh, Shannon Sharp, a Hall of Fame football player that serves as a groupie for LeBron, Skip Bayless, a uh, who's now He's a Jordan guy. relevant, and I get yeah, and and He's a Jordan guy though. It, that now I'm sorry, and I got to correct. Oh my God, I, yeah, Skip Bayless certainly criticized LeBron James, but he's quit. He he. he he jumped off the criticizing LeBron James deal five, six years ago. I mean, he quit. He completely pivoted because he wanted to be accepted by the hip-hop crowd. And so I, I do want to correct that record. Skip Bayless out Jason, I'm sorry for, for, for getting that. But he used to criticize LeBron. Jason, you talk about that Dallas series, which, by the way, is now, what, 12, 13 years ago? I mean, time flies. He literally got outplayed at times by Jason Terry, and J.J. Barea gave him fits. And there were large stretches of that series and games where LeBron would disappear on the weak side and nothing would happen. And you're thinking, could you imagine if Jordan did that? I can't because it never happened. Not in an NBA final series. Also, if Greg Popovich does not take out Tim Duncan in that one series and Tim Duncan gets that loose rebound and Ray Allen doesn't hit that Jesus Shuttlesworth prayer, which is a great shot, he has one championship. Not two, not three, not four, not five, right? And then let's look back at how that Miami run ended with the Heatles, as they called them. They got absolutely dismantled by the beautiful game of basketball played by the Spurs. I mean, they absolutely wrecked them after game two. Look, I get it. Basketball is a team game. It takes a lot of parts, but I do know this. Generally, teams that had Michael Jordan from about his seventh year on, and that's when they each won their first title, seventh year, for LeBron and Michael, I believe. It didn't seem to happen to a lot of Michael Jordan teams. I'll just leave it at that, Mr. Whitlock. Mm. Uh, yeah, I had, Steve, you, you just gave me – was it was it LeBron's seventh year that he won a title? It was the seventh or eighth, yeah, yes. Sense. It was right around the same time. Yeah, that yes. makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right, hold, I got some more I want to talk to you about, Nick Saban, Dak Prescott, but uh, let me take care of our great friends at Prize Picks. Whether it's tournament season or the race for the playoff home court, cash in on basketball's big moments with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, and place your entry. Turn $10 into $1,000 with just four correct picks. You can choose from the traditional stats like Steph Curry, more or less more or less on points, or more unique ones like Kevin Durant, more or less on dunks. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks America's number one fantasy sports app. Join the Prize Picks community of more than three million users who have already signed up. My mom, Mama Whitlock, you know, who taught me how to gamble. Not bragging, I'm just keeping it real. Uh, she loves to play prize picks. She had great picks during the football season. She's got even more picks during the basketball season. Uh, tonight, today, she's got Luka Doncic more than 55 points plus rebounds plus assists. That's points plus rebounds plus assists, more than 55 and a half. 
uh, Golden State, uh, against Golden State. Uh, she's got LeBron James, less than 26 and a half points versus Sacramento. Zion Williamson, less than six rebounds versus the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Pick app and use the promo code FEARLESS. That's code FEARLESS on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Must be present in certain states. Visit prizepicks.com for restrictions and details. Prize Picks. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Uh, Steve. I want to circle back uh, to Nick Saban. And he just, he said some things in an ESPN interview, and now he's taken those same things to Congress, sitting next to Ted Cruz on Capitol Hill, I believe, yesterday. Uh, Saban aired out uh, college football and talked about uh, how the entire system has been disrupted by name, image, and likeness. And, and he wants something done about it. Let, let's play the clip of Nick Saban uh, talking about the state of football. Well, all the things that I believed in for all these years, 50 years of coaching, no longer exist in college athletics. So it's always was about developing players. It was always about uh, helping people be more successful in life. Uh, my wife even said to me, we'd have all the recruits over on Sunday uh, with their parents for breakfast and uh, she would always meet with the mothers and uh, talk about how she was going to help and uh, impact their um, sons and how they would be well taken care of. And she came to me, you know, like right before I retired and said, why, why are we doing this? And I said, what do you mean? She said, all they care about is how much you're going to pay them. They don't care about how you're going to develop them, which is all what we've always done. So why are we doing this? So. He's restating what was quoted in an ESPN article, but he had a lot to say in front of Congress. A lot of people are attacking Nick Saban. Uh, you know, he made all that money. Now he's upset the players are making money. You know, I think it's far deeper than that, and I think he's expressing some genuine concern that a lot of coaches uh, have right now. But your thoughts on what Nick Saban here said to Congress? Well, Jason, in addition to what you just mentioned, also, there is a belief that Alabama for years had been doing their own version of an NIL, and now they're just upset that it's a level playing field. Okay, uh, whatever that it means, I happen to believe it. But with that said, I, I just wish that... Hold, hold for one second, hold for one second. Expound on that. Expound. You believe that, that, that they were paying all their players and he's oh, yeah. being hypocritical here? That is my view, but I don't think that makes him a hypocrite. I think what makes it a uh, hypocritical is now he's upset that it's a level playing field. Look, if, if you think that the certain programs or the top level do not have a system of payment, and then you probably put your uh, missing teeth underneath your pillow expecting a $20 bill in the morning. I'm sorry, but everyone kind of plays on the same playing field, but now it's really a level playing field. And I think what bothers Nick is not even the players getting paid. I really don't. I think a lot of players would say, you know what, give these guys something, give them a piece of the pie. They deserve it. I want them to do well. I don't think it's Nick Saban not wanting the players to get their just desserts. But I think he needs to make a better point of that and also saying, hey, look, I made a lot of money too, but this is the industry that I chose and I'm a capitalist. Just admit it. You didn't do it out of the goodness of your heart. You took a passion and made it your profession and you were highly successful. I think right there takes away a lot of the people that'll tell you, well, Nick, you got paid. Well, yeah, that's his job. That's the going market for a national championship caliber coach. However, Jason, I really do think Nick Saban and his wife, Terry, who's a large part of that, they are very sincere in a sense that it became a issue and they were delusioned with the fact that kids didn't just come to Alabama because, you know what? We trust you with our son. We believe you'll make us a better person. And that when our football career ends, whether it's four years from now or 10 years from now, we're still at the age of 28. I still got to find another job outside of the realm of football, and maybe even sooner than that, that you're going to help our son be prepared for the real world. Because nowadays it's just about, uh, yeah, coach, we really like you and your facilities and your academic programs, and we like the way your school is socially, 
But um, what can you do in terms of NIL? I mean, Jason, the NIL has been completely bastardized because it used to be or was intended to be about an iconic player. I think Chris Weber at Michigan, Reggie Bush at USC, that if you bought their paraphernalia and their jerseys, they got a piece of it, right? Now it's just about a collective of money raised by alumni and donors, and let's just break off the players. That's not what the NIL was intended to be. Steve, I, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you. Not completely, but maybe 90%. I think Nick Saban lived in a bubble of, of perhaps you would call it delusion. I, I would call it he lived in his own little world where he was uninvolved in whatever Alabama players got as extras. He was completely uninvolved and disconnected from that. Boosters handled that. Maybe he knew that they did, but he, he was uninvolved. And so when he talked to athletes and parents, he talked about what he could deliver, what he was in control of. I'm going to disciple you as a football player and help you grow as a professional prospect, and we're going to have a support system in place that allows you to get educated and earn a degree at Alabama. That's what Nick Saban felt like he controlled. This NIL system now places it on his desk. It's like the, the boosters now somewhat report to Nick Saban as it relates to passing out the extra goodies and extra benefits. And so the players then started bringing those concerns to Nick Saban. Whereas yeah. before, he was sitting there, my name's Bennett, I ain't in it. You need to go talk to uh, the guy that owns that car lot in Birmingham or, or, where, or Tuscaloosa or whatever. I'm not involved in that. I can talk to you about football and I can talk to you about academic help. That's what I control. So I believe he's in a bit of his own delusion. I, I, I'll just give you an example of, <clears throat> and I'm not, I'm just saying this to be transparent. Uh, I'm not from Brady Hoke to uh, Pete Limbo. I can't remember all the different coaches at Ball State, but you could knock them all over with uh, a feather if, 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 if you told them, like, hey, uh, Jason Whitlock took care of many Ball State players while you were coaching there. Because that's factual. And they had no idea. But there were, I, I so cared about Ball State. There was a time that I took care of as many players as I possibly could and helped them with little different things. You know, because I mean, and, and it was always in a, a situation where people were in real need. It wasn't just taking care of some guy because he was a great player. But, but again, if you listen to the story that, that I've told many times, how do you think? We had a player, Dante Love, who broke his neck on the field. And I went to the hospital with him, and I've been involved in his life ever since. And, and helped to, you know, Dante's now 36, got his own job. Just had his third kid. He's a great young man. But, but you know, when that dude broke his neck, I, I got all in on his life and did many things that probably the NCAA would call illegal. But if you knew Dante Love, you knew where he came from. And I'm sorry, I, I hope I, by saying this, I, you know, I think the NCAA is neutered and it doesn't matter. But the, I'm just, coaches don't know. I, I hope the statute of limitations has run out on you because, you know, John Wooden had <laughs> Sam Gilbert. Friday yeah. Night Lights had Buddy Garrity. Ball State had Jason Whitlock. Wow. And, and Miami had Nevin Shapiro, but I don't want to get into that. Yeah, I, Look, I think a lot of what you say is true. The coaches do not want to be the ones directly involved, and that's the problem. You can ignore something or say, hey, I had nothing to do with this if it's under the table. But when it's so far out over the table now, you're right, because now you're dealing with egos. Now you're dealing with guys that want to transfer. Here's another factor if you're a coach. If you paid a guy as part of the collective a lot, there's probably going to be boosters saying, hey, you know that kid that we paid a couple hundred thousand dollars to to pretend like he cares about our product? Why is he third string? I mean, there are, there's a whole Pandora's box that has opened up with this now. Yeah, so I hope I – hope I would love to talk to, interview Nick Saban. 
and have a real conversation about this because I, I think it's a press. There needs something needs to happen. No one can figure out what it is, but this current system doesn't allow coaches to pass on. And again, I'm telling you, Nick Saban thought he was like, "Hey, I'm developing you as a football player. I'm, I'm helping you get through academically, and if you're interested." I will share with you my life success principles. Take them or leave them. And, and, and now he's like, all the players care about is what am I going to get right now? Instant gratification. And, and it's all greed. And they're all at, so they can buy more gold chains. And it's all in his face. It's all, they're, they're driving uh, $100,000 cars. Uh, uh, they, they got jewelry everywhere. Take the, the, uh, the young recruit, I think he wasn't even on campus yet, but he was going to be a freshman. They got busted with all those drugs. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is like the reality that Nick Saban knows that he can't talk about is that, and I know it because I lived it. I, I saw, we had two dope dealers, uh, and I'll call one of them out by name because he's, he's dead and he got killed by... Uh, uh, some kind of Colombian or South American cartel. I'm just telling you in reality. And oh, i not trying to just, everybody knew it. We had an offensive tackle named Javon Harvey, talented kid from Fort Wayne, Indiana. And he dealt dope while on the Ball State football team. And once he left Ball State, and as an adult, he became a major dope dealer in Fort Wayne. Go look it up. Killed by a cartel in his home in, 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 Fort Wayne, I'm just, these are just facts. Ugh. And so a lot of these young guys that we're giving thousands of dollars to, and they, oh man, I got $30,000. The first thing that they think about it, or, or someone puts in their head, hey man, I can turn that 30 into 60 if we just invest in this or that. And, and it's, it's young people and money. I, I, I've seen it, I, I got family members that, that you know, have told me for years or, you know, early on, but now I'm so stubborn and I'm so set in my way. No one says anything to me. They're halfway scared of me. But I got relatives like, oh, Jay, let me hold 100K and I'll get you 200K back in a month. <laughs> okay, good luck with that, brother. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, that's what coaches are dealing with and they can't talk about it. And I've had other coaches talk about, and Nick Saban knows this, it's this underbelly. It's like a level of truth that no one's ready for. But I've had a major college basketball coach share with me that all this NIL deal has gamblers are taking advantage of this. Yeah. To start up relationships with the players. Give them a little NIL money and now they can communicate with the player regularly and they can get inside information on what's going on with the team. And if things get tight, they can ask for a favor from that kid these are the genuine concerns of coaches, and, and we just think it, we have this very sophomoric, uh, shallow conversation over Twitter about what's going on, and oh, these guys are just racist, and they just don't want the players to get any money. It's it's much deeper than that. It, it's you know, much as the deeper. years go on, Jason, blue chips will look more and more like a documentary. I, I suggest everyone Ooh. go watch that because a lot of those things that you talk about, like the gambling, the point shaving. The coach, Nick Nolte, who then became in on the deal and felt guilty about it. Great movie, by the way. Great movie. Uh, let's move to the story on Dak Prescott. It's a sad story. Uh, it's a troubling story. A woman, I believe her name is Victoria Shore, uh, allegedly, according to Dak Prescott, was trying to extort him for $100 million. And... Dak filed a counter lawsuit or mm. a preemptive lawsuit against her. She, she hadn't filed her suit. She was trying to handle this privately, but she's saying that seven years ago, Dak Prescott sexually assaulted her in the back of an SUV, and, and now she wants money. And, and to me, on the surface, it's like, wow, this sounds like a Deshaun Watson type situation. And, and I say that in this regard. What it came out like 30, 40 women said Deshaun Watson did something to them, masseuses or whatever. I don't personally believe that. I believe a handful, three or four of these masseuses were legitimate and were violated by Deshaun Watson. 
And then I think another 20, 25 or so of these women hopped on board because they was like, oh, he's vulnerable. We got blood in the water. Let me get some. As it relates to that, I think this woman and her lawyers are realizing, like, because of the Deshaun Watson situation, Dak is vulnerable. And, and so we can, behind the scenes, do a shakedown on him because maybe seven years ago, there was some sort of uncomfortable sexual something that went on. And Dak would rather just cut a check privately, not a $100 million check, but cut a check privately than deal with the public uh, scorn and smear that's going on. Dak, to me, to his credit, is like, F that, I'm going to sue you for slandering me and hurting my uh, reputation. I'm on Dak Prescott's side on this. I feel sorry for Dak Prescott. Uh, her lawyers did an interview on Dallas's uh, team radio station yesterday. This guy's name is Yoel Zihay or, or whatever. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but uh, surface level, give me your first reaction, and then we'll play some clips from her lawyer on a Dallas radio station, and we'll go a cut deeper. Your initial thoughts here. Uh, so if this is the natural evolution of the Me Too movement, so now what is this called? The not me or the not him? I, I don't know what to really say other than the fact that um, – Boy, Dak just couldn't get a hotel room, had to do an SUV. Yeah, those don't usually end up well. But look, I am very, very cynical about these allegations that come years later. I really am. If you really feel as though you were violated or assaulted in any way unlawfully, you should immediately report these type of violations. To do it years later, uh, and whether it's fair or not, I may get heat for it. I think it cheapens it to a point where I am so cynical I tend not to believe it. We see all of these men who are generally very powerful and or rich, all of a sudden, I don't want to say the word shook down, but it almost seems like well-organized extortion attempts. Again, I'm going to make this point again. If you were violated in any way unlawfully, physically, that is something that should be reported immediately. And I'm not trying to victim shame here, but I am going by recent track record and common sense. OK, so my view is very simple. I'm skeptical. Steve, before I play these clips, I just want to pause here because I don't want us to be in any sort of rush. I want to take care of our good friends at Good Ranchers. Did you know that mRNA vaccines are approved and in use for pigs in the United States? The mystery continues to grow in the meat industry. And every day I'm more thankful for my Good Rancher subscription. I don't have to worry about imported meat, unknown vaccines, or experimental things in the meat I feed myself and my family. During their Say MRA, MR No to MRNA sale, Good Ranchers is offering you a free 10 pound Easter ham with any subscription. Their ham is fantastic, and unlike the pork at the store, it is guaranteed to be free from MRNA vaccines. This is a $119 ham that you will get free with my code FEARLESS. So go to GoodRanchers.com today to say M-R-N-O for your meat. During this sale, every subscription enjoys $25 off any box, a free $119 heritage ham, and the Good Ranchers Lifetime Quality Commitment. They're promised to never compromise on quality, plus with their never M-R-N-O pledge, you can be sure that you're getting meat that's free from any unknown or potentially harmful additives every single month. What I really love about Good Ranchers is their commitment to transparency. They believe that you have the right to know exactly what's in your food, and they're not afraid to show you. They're amazing supporters of this show. So go and support them and stand and take a stand for a company that's taking a stand for you. No one else is being as loud or as active on this issue as good ranchers, and it's because they genuinely want to provide you with the best meat in America. Go to GoodRanchers.com, use my code FEARLESS to get your free Easter ham with your subscription today. GoodRanchers.com, promo code FEARLESS. Say no to M-R-N-O and yes to Good Ranchers. American meat delivered. 
Steve, uh, let me play a couple of these clips here from her attorney. Uh, I think the first one uh, is he talks about uh, could there be criminal charges filed from this seven-year-old claim? What we can say is that the lawsuits um, are very imminent, very, very imminent. What I, I'm curious if you can walk us through how you got to the number that the allegation that Jack Prescott sent a text to Clarence Hill with Fort Worth Star Telegram saying, quote, she's trying to get $100 million from me to, quote, not report a rape case I obviously did not do. Is that $100 million figure accurate? How did you come up with that number? Well, you know, um, in certain cases, um, and, you know, ra rape is uh, on the level of wrongful death, you know, uh, one of the things, one of the most common phrases for wrongful death is, uh, what's the price can you put on a, on, a, on a dead person's life? Well, what's the price that you can put on a rape? Uh, the, the trauma that comes from that. Mm. Uh, $100 million? You, that's the price you can put on it? That, that They're asking for 100 probably want $10 million. Uh, here's a second side explaining... Uh, the lawsuit. Let's take a listen. To, I mean, to his credit, he's a hard fighting attorney and Dak, I'm sure, is paying him millions of dollars. And, um, you know, this is just a legal tactic, but there's nothing extortionist about it. But we're just very disappointed that he would try to flip the script and make himself the victim. And just for the record, we have reached out to try to get in contact with Levi McCathern and we're told there will be no interviews on that front at this time. So I, I'm curious about this, and, and I understand this is a very difficult subject, but can you walk me through the time lapse? So the allegation was that this happened in February of 2017. What happens that makes it take seven years to bring this to the forefront? Well, you know, this is actually very normal uh, in sexual assault cases, and there's very... Uh, there's, there's a lot of data regarding this, and we see experts actually testify about this in criminal cases often, that it takes time for sexual assault victims to come out. Now, you got to keep in mind, not only is she a sexual assault victim, but we're talking about Dak Prescott. We're talking about the quarterback of America's team. I, I don't I don't like any of this. It It... it Dak Prescott has had an impeccable reputation off the field, sketchy reputation on the field. I'm a little bit shocked that the Cowboys flagship radio station is hosting this interview. That, that surprises me. Uh, and then there's, I mean, and again, this is really going conspiracy theory, but there are people that are like, is some of this a tactic by the Cowboys to reduce Dak's yeah. leverage, <laughs> reduce his leverage and or get rid of him. Yeah. Is that a possibility? Hey, look, it, now that you bring it up, I'm thinking either you want a haircut or you want to cut ties. But Jason, the guy compared what happened to this victim, or lack of a better word, or the plaintiff here or the defendant as almost dying, like comparing it to a death, right? I, I have a question. So the last time there's a murder charge on anybody, you take seven years to litigate it or to bring it up. I, I want to bring this up again. If it is that serious, I, I think you got to report it right then because, I again, this is just my personal view, and I don't know if it holds up legally and anyone can disagree with me. When you wait that long and then you attach a price tag, whether you think it's exorbitant or not, I find it to be very spurious, very suspicious. And I have a question. These type of lawsuits that, number one, come with a lot of time and then come with the price tag, it never seems to happen to that regular factory worker or that unknown accountant. It always seems to happen to rich, powerful, famous men. Is it just a coincidence? I'm not sure, but I, I have my feelings on it, Jason. Steve, I... The Cowboy, did you ever watch the TV show uh, Billions? It was on Showtime. Oh, yeah. I watched the whole yeah. series. Got terrible at the end. Yeah. It was horrible at the end. But early on, it was great. And what I loved about it was 
it showed you the games that billionaires would play on each other and how they would get back at each other. And, and I can remember th there was maybe in season two or three, th there was this elaborate scam they ran on someone's product, maybe it was some sort of ice cream or yogurt, and it, it undermined the stock prices and blah. And yeah. anyway, it, it just let me know like, Man, they play a game of chess at that billionaire level and how they get at each other and damage each other at a super high level. And so I'm looking at athletes move into, not billionaires, but heck, I think we, I just read somewhere where like, Kirk Cousins has signed like contracts that have guaranteed him close to $300 million. Uh, Patrick Mahomes is probably well on his way to earning a billion dollars in the NFL. Dak Prescott's going to earn $300, $400, $500 million in the NFL. And so this, what I'm looking at with Dak, reminds me of the show Billions. And it's like, here's how you leverage a guy with a lot of wealth who's perhaps out over his skis. There was talk of Dak getting a $60 million contract. There's clearly Dak's not worth the amount of money the Cowboys have been paying him. And, and Dak and his age, and so the, I'm not accusing Jerry Jones or anybody of anything, but, but it just, th this whole, the, the, I'm telling you, that lawyer being on the Cowboys flagship radio station doesn't sit right with me, it doesn't, it doesn't seem, it, it would never, it, it would never happen in Kansas City in terms of, I saw Kansas City's top sports talk radio host, a guy named Kevin Keatsman. He, he tried to criticize Andy Reid and Andy Reid's handling, I think, of Tyreek Hill and some other players. And, and he brought Andy Reid's own sons into the argument. And they vanquished that guy mm. from Sports Radio 810 almost immediately. And he was the top guy there for 15 years. And they just got rid of him. And so these franchises have a lot of power with local media. And to see this guy being able to smear Dak on the Cowboys flagship radio station kind of blows me away. And it, it, again, it reminds me of like, this is the type of game. Why can't I think of the redheaded guy? Who was the star of Billions? Uh, it was a Bobby, Bobby Axelrod. Bobby. Yeah, yeah Axe. Bobby Axelrod. This guy... Yeah, this is kind of game Axe would play on a comp on a billionaire competitor. And the show was never, it really got bad when Axe quit the show. But anyway, your thoughts and my billions analogy. Yeah, and by the way, if you're Dak Prescott or any other quarterback that's not going to settle down like Kirk Cousins, uh, I'm going to give you some advice. It's not the most moral or ethical, but i got to be on. Guys, print out a bunch of NDAs and consent forms and have these young ladies sign them. Get a notary, stamp it. This way, you'll say you save yourself a lot of these accusations. I, I just I don't know what to say. These guys are targets in a lot of ways. Now, do I think some of these guys are perpetrators and predators? They probably are, but this is a game that they willingly go into, and they're almost playing Russian roulette. And look, I'm just gonna say it one more time. If this was a serious allegation, which they're saying it is, and she was sexually assaulted or violated in any way. Why wait seven years? That's the qu And again, I know people are going to come down on me. I don't give a about it. That's the way I feel. And I just think it just seems to never happen to unknown construction workers for some reason. Well, you're right in your advice. I would give separate advice. Hey, these guys need to uh, straighten up, get married, protect themselves. <laughs> I'm being realistic uh, here. And I'm being realistic, Jason. I'm being I, I, I got it, but I'm being realistic. <laughs> if you want to, and again, I'm not saying Dak was out in strip clubs or whatever, but if you want to play Russian roulette with your reputation, uh, just keep swiping left and right on Tinder and picking up girls at bars and, and, and you know, bartenders and, and just putting yourself in vulnerable situations. Again, I... Now again, I'm old, and so I've I've I know how many budget, bullets I've dodged, but but when you got that kind of money, man, yeah, you're a target. Don't be alone you with some woman you don't know. You are a target. That's the number yeah. one issue that these young men have to realize. You are a target. I I read about some NBA player 
that just recently got some lady named Drea. And I said, oh, that's nice. Then I find out she's 38 and he's 21. I'm saying, that's not nice. Not nice. But again, he got targeted and he got hit. Steve, uh, thank you so much. Great job as always. Uh, I'm going to call an audible here. I, I want to do uh, Tennessee Harmony and, and the conversation I want to have about Hazelwood East and identity. I want to do that with uh, Anthony and Dave Shannon. Chalk Knox is going to join us. I'm going to do that as a separate. We're going to wrap up today's show uh, right here. I do want to remind you all before I get out of here, go to fearlessarmyrollcall.com. Roll Call 2.0 is going to be incredible. I told you guys yesterday about uh, the people hopping on board with us. You'll want to be here Saturday, June 1st. FearlessArmyRollCall.com. Uh, we'll play tomorrow, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. We are living, get back. We are receiving all the seeds when we all want to be free. We want freedom. I just want, I want to be. I just want, I want to be. I just want, I want to be. I just want.